Okay. Uh, good morning, I guess, folks. So um, uh, welcome again. Thanks. I guess I didn't scare everyone away yesterday. I'm going to try to um, give a, a little bit. So one comment I got yesterday was I could, somebody said I could talk at a quarter of the speed. So I'm going <laughs> to slow down even more. Um, and um, I'm going to, but I'm going to first to try to make up for those of you that maybe I dropped yesterday as to just give you a quick review of what I tried to tell you in an hour and a half yesterday with lots of good discussion in more like 10 or 15 minutes um, right now at the start. So I'm going to show you that at the beginning again as a bit of review. And then we'll get on to today's section, which is, um, remember, this is all about vision, about object vision. Um, and yesterday, I tried to show you where in the brain the key computations were taking place and how we think about those in population spaces. And, but I left open the question I want to talk about today is how do, the, how do we go from an image to those population patterns of activity that I kept referring to yesterday in the place called infratemporal cortex. So this is a slide that we talked a lot about yesterday, so I'm putting it up again just to, again, make sure everybody's on the same page is that the, the big picture I tried to give you guys yesterday was that you can think of any image that we present to the animal, remember central 10 degrees, let's say 100 millisecond duration, produces a measured pattern of activity across a sample set of neurons. These are here, I'm just showing N neurons, where N is typically a number of 100 to 1,000 out of, remember, about 10 million neurons within IT cortex, so you have a sample there. Um, and we count, we can kind of observe the spike times, which are shown as tick marks here. And we then do um, various ways of uh, collapsing these data, which we refer to as possible codes. And the simplest one that I presented to you yesterday was just count spikes over a time window of 100 milliseconds. I'm going to relax that, um, not, probably not today, maybe tomorrow. Um, and um, count, and then do that for just a random set of neurons randomly taken, just like the experimenterly, experimenter randomly samples from IT, that is my lab or I or whoever did the experiment randomly samples from IT. We think of downstream readers of IT as maybe equivalently drawing a set of samples, wires if you will, off of IT and having to learn on those samples to then perform a task like recognition. So the, the, this is an example of what, what actually might happen in the brain in response, in IT, in response to that image. Um, this is its collapsed, or its sort of condensed code version where we have one mean response um, to each, here, one mean response for each neuron. So there's n neurons, there's n values here. And again, I told you what, this is just ex trying to show one real trial. In practice, again, what we do is we might re repeat the stimulus 50 times and we give an average value over 50 repetitions, so sort of the average response to this image from that neuron. And, um, and so here we'll have, we had, again, this looks like about 20 stimulated neurons. If we had, you know, 100 neurons, we'd have 100 values here. Um, and again, each is just a real value, which is the, the observed average spike rate over this time window of that site to this image. So we have many such vectors like this that I showed you as big green vectors yesterday, and I'll have that in a second. And then I talked talk to you about thinking of those vectors as just points within this n-dimensional space of neurons, the mean and some uncertainty around the mean. And I showed you this drawing here where we said you can think of the, the points as being projected. Not, this, is not, um, this is now in the IT neural space um, as just being a dot. It's just another way of looking at this data. It's just a re-representation of the data. And the reason we like this is because now you can get the idea that you have to deal with not just one image, but many images together, and you have to find rules that you can carve this space so that you can um, build those rules from some of the images and then generalize to new images. So we do that with linear classifiers, which are here shown in this case as a line in, in a two-dimensional two space, but a plane in three space or a hyperplane in a higher dimensional space, which is, again, just trying to cut the space with this um, uh, into two parts. Um, one, in this case, to say, the images belong to the category face, and these images belong to not face. And um, I tried to tell you the idea that is if you, you're going to train on linear classifiers, if you do this in a space of IT, 
it turns out that you generalize quite well, whereas if you do this in like just the raw pixels or in lower level visual representations, you don't do as well. And not only do you do well in terms of performance, but you do well in terms of predicting the animal's uh, patterns of behavior, both its strengths and its weaknesses across many different types of recognition tasks. This is sort of face versus not face. But again, you think of one classifier for each possible subtask, car versus not car. And so when you build a lot of those, then you get those kind of colorful behavioral patterns we spent a lot of time looking at yesterday. And I'll show again in the slide. But this is the kind of one of the ways I want you to just think about how, how we hypothesize how a place like IT can support the general space of core recognition across many subtasks within core recognition. So um, that is this, that, let me just back up and let me take questions right here. So that, that's a bit of a review from yesterday. Is everybody okay where we are? Okay. So this is, again, it's a hypothesis. You may have other views. This came up in question as to other ways of thinking of the spike codes and so forth. I'm just saying this does pretty well. Now here those spike, that yellow vector is now a, blue, a green vector here and there's many of them, many images stacked up here. That's what's shown here. 2,000 images now. Um, and what I tried to tell you yesterday is like not just for face versus not face, but many tasks, which is kind of drawn here as subtask behavioral difficulties. Um, this is behavioral data, these are neural data. And I'm saying if you build linear decoders on this and you show and you predict the performance on held out images, that you get the performance that the animal shows us on held out images, which is what I'm showing you here. In fact, the, the data I'm showing you here aren't actually on held out images for the aficionados, but we can, because we, it's hard to get all images being held out, but we can show that um, we, the animal's performance on held out images is very well approximated by, by these data here. So, um, so this is the big picture that you can take linear decoders out of these IT population spaces, randomly selected groups of neurons, train with some reasonable amount of training samples, and predict the animal's performance. That is, you can build what appears to be a behaving monkey just from linear decoders out of a sample of IT neurons. That's the upshot there. So the summary I wanted you to have from day one is that you the feature set, if you will, out of IT, which again we think of as about somewhere around 100 to 1,000 dimensional underlying encoding dimensions that are carried across 10 million neurons, so a lot of redundancy in there. But that feature set we think of as the penultimate product of this recognition processing pipeline that then can support behavior with just these linear classifiers. I skipped this slide yesterday, so I'm going to stick it in here just because, again, it reinforces the message I'm trying to give you is when you think of us learning many new objects and somehow being able to handle those all together and still say, oh, I can still recognize a car or a dog or a plane, and when I learn about cars, I don't apparently influence my recognition of planes. Um, the way we think about that is that um, uh, our working hypothesis, again, is that there's a, a, essentially a largely stable set of features encodings from the image here in IT that's sufficient for all future objects that you may want to learn. I mean, when you're born or you're a monkey, monkey doesn't know what a car is, but we teach the monkey what a car is. And this is relevant because a lot of this, car, this course is about learning. I think that's the title of the course. Um, I'm really talking about representation with the learning part that I've told you so far is uh, about on living on top of IT, these classifiers that live on top of IT. So we are basically a, modeling this. We think of this as being a kind of almost a stable set of features that might undergo development, postnatal development, but is reasonably uh, already quite powerful so that you just need a thin level of learning on it. In machine learning languages, this is called you know, back-end training or just, um, just uh, training up a softmax layer on top of a feature set. So um, again, this is the powerful part that there's a feature set in IT that we think of as about 100 dimensional. And you can learn to learn faces or dogs or apples or trees or bananas or cars if I try to teach you those things, or we do teach the monkey those things. So one slide I didn't show you yesterday that I alluded to that I think is a, kind of important to set context with regard to that idea and learning is that all that behavioral data I showed you from the monkey, this is monkey performance relative to human. So here's a bunch, a bunch of different objects the animals learned. Here's one, so this is like human level performance. You see the monkey is, as I said yesterday, about at human level after it learns. So the data I'm showing you comes from when the animals already learn, in fact, extending well beyond here as we keep collecting data from these animals. But here I'm highlighting for you this period where we first have to, the animal has to say, oh, I don't know what a dog is. I'm gonna, he's showing me pictures of dogs. I'm getting juice reward. I'm somehow getting up to human, observed level human performance across new images of dogs. Um, but there's this learning window here. So I'm just trying to highlight that I was showing you the kind of call it the steady state performance when I show you these pictures of both humans 
and monkeys. And humans are actually close to this performance when they come into the test, we think, because we're showing objects that were driven by things that all of us mostly know. Um, but monkeys have to be trained to do this. But they train up in about a few thousand trials, which is about one to four days the way we run this. So it takes a monkey about one to four days to get up to human level performance. And I'm showing you all this because, again, when we measure IT itself, it's reasonably stable if you look at animals recording IT before and after these things. Or if you look at data, you can get good decodes out of IT for doing these tasks even in untrained animals. So I'm saying this all to just to emphasize that we don't think that the power of this system is resulting from the actual training of the monkey. Uh, we think of the training of the monkey as being building up what we're approximating with those downstream classifiers that I showed you. And those are sort of standing in for what the monkey does. And you could ask us a lot of good questions that we're working on now about you know, what type of exact linear classifier are you using? Is that correct or not? And, and we don't know all the answers to that. I'm just saying this by way to, to, to leave you by saying that IT already in the adult animal, even an untrained animal, is already set up to be ready to learn with just one linear classifier layer. It's not because we had to train these animals to do objects. It's somehow a powerful feature set already in place in an adult animal. Okay, does that make sense so far? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I knew someone was going to ask you that. And I don't have that ready. I mean, it does. It should put some limits. It depends on the, you know, the objects and the layout of the space. And I, that's a great question. And I, I don't have a, a prepared answer for that other than to say. So your question would be like, well, let's train a monkey to do 1,000 objects. Or what's the limit? We haven't pushed the animals up to how far. When do they sort of start breaking down in that regard? So we've only get up to like 100 or so. So they can handle up to that pretty well. And again, humans have been estimated to know about several thousand. Um, that's an estimate of what humans may know for objects. So your question is, is that space sufficient to do that? And we don't really know, um, but um, we believe it would be, but we don't know yet. And I think there are good theoretical questions there about the layout of the space and what's the capacity of that to learn classifications and we can do it for, it has been done um, for arbitrary groupings of things but we don't think humans are only learning arbitrary things so that's the more interesting case um, for arbitrary kind of cuts of a space you can do the the, the the theory around that but on the sort of more naturalistic cases it's harder to, to know what the answer to this is yeah uh, So the way we did it here was we take the, really uh, the, the nuts and bolts of it are is you, down, you basically build up three-dimensional models, like you have models of cars and dogs and trees. And then we get a bunch of those 3D models, and then we actually place them on Mechanical Turk and ask a bunch of humans out there to say, give us a free, free label of this. And if 90% of humans return the same label, we call it a basic level object. So if they, they at least 90% say elephant and you know, don't say animal, then we'll say, OK, 90% of humans will tend to call that the same thing. And that's the kind of psychologist definition of a basic level category. And so then we only use those objects in our tests. So we start with a model set that's generated by you know, the world of gamers and video designers and whoever created such things. And then we push them through a bunch of human testing to sort of make sure they meet that bar. And then they make it into our test set. And we have a, a battery of several hundred of those that we still keep trying to expand. And I'm showing you a subset. And we think these are, these are just arbitrary samples of that set. We, we didn't try to choose them to be, oh, we needed elephants or dogs. We, we think of them as just sampling from that very large space of possible objects that meet those, those generative criteria that I'm, I'm, tr I'm loosely describing for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so we haven't, um, you know, we've done a little bit of, cat so when you say category, you mean cross category exemplar variability like there's many chairs, for instance. Like, so, so I can have this specific 3D model of a chair versus I have eight 3D models of a chair, yet they're still all called chairs. That's what you mean by the chair category as, as opposed to, you know, chair in this room type one chair, right? Um, I'm mixing those up together. So the question is, and I'm being a little fast and loose with those, and it'll come up a, a little bit later. Um, but let me phrase your question kind of more. When you, when you want, maybe we, when you want to know is precisely for these data, I'll tell you, these were specific models of like a fixed chair. Um, 
Um, and the pay data I showed you yesterday, which was the dot, the, group, the blue dots on a scatter plot, those were actually category data where there were many chairs within the group. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing together studies to give you the general idea. Um, so we've kind of done both, and your question may be, well, you know, can you see slight differences in the ability of the decoder to predict under those two cases? And, and we don't see that yet, but I wouldn't say that that means it's not present. Um, it's kind of one of these things that could be looked at more deeply. I mean, one, the first pass is you do it either way, and linear decodes out of IT roughly predict what you're going to get. That's the first pass answer. The details are still to be pushed further. Yeah, okay. Um, Davide, yeah. So you said that uh, you can consider the first approximation of your representations in IT, but also, I guess, on the earlier in your areas, they're, they're locked, right? You like it. Uh, yeah, as a first approximation, consider them in the adult as pretty stable. <laughs> right. Yeah. So my question is, how do you reconcile the, the, those studies, including the human, the new or Right. Right. So, so there's, there's, yeah. Davide is referring to work which we did that I still really like, and I don't yet. It'll connect to what I'll try to show you next, which is that you can play statistical tricks where you show this repeated, you know, strong statistical changes in the environment, and you can get particular shifts in the IT responses over a period of hours. Right. You don't know how long those last, over days or weeks. It's, it's still not clear when they, if, how what the recovery period is. But the way I think about those results, which I believe, and these other results, which I believe, which are decoders, are, um, you know, you also may know of results of if you look at synaptic physiology on two-photon imaging, that you see synaptic turnover in the brain, even in the visual system, all the time, right? So the brain is both changing at one level, but stable at another. So the way I think about those results is that most of us are living in a reasonably stable, stationary statistical environment. And if I don't change that, I get something that looks stable. But if I push on it in particular ways, I can get it to bend. So th the way I think about the system is it's bendable. But when we observe it, it's mostly not bending because it's the stationary statistics of the environment are kind of holding it in a, in a reasonably stable place. That's how, I, in my head, I bring those together. Um, but you see that may not be, that's not a satisfying answer because you're like, well, Jim, you're saying it's plastic. It's just not plastic under the, the traditional, like these learning, like this learning protocol, I would say, is not changing it much, right? right. But, but a particular statistical manipulation that, that pushes it in a certain way could change it. Right. So, so, but this, I guess, pushes uh, an interpretation that perhaps uh, an explicit uh, paradigm in which a monkey or a human has to explicitly learn to look at data as a new object requires a learning uh, with a new object. So uh, learning, uh, you know, why to get the representation with already this new object? Why there's another kind of learning that they can also provide, monitoring of the environment. Right, that's and if something happens funky at the statistical environment, then that kind of learning will actually induce modification. That, that's how I think about it too. Right. It's sort of in the simple minded way is the ventral stream is subjective to certain types of unsupervised learning. Um, but and but this learning, which is reinforced learning, can be best approximated as downstream. But of course both that's an oversimplification. Probably some reinforced learning like this drifts into IT, and there have been studies that show that. Those effects, I just want to emphasize to this group, are small relative to the stimulus-driven effects. So they're sort of second order, but they're there. So in terms of, kind of conveying knowledge, it's nice to sort of sweep them under the rug, as I've done here, but they certainly exist in both directions. Um, yeah, OK. <laughs> Okay, so um, okay, so I said this. So let's we're going to get on to today. So so here's the you know this is what we just got through saying. It's like hey, you can approximate that one to two day learning of the animal with linear classifiers that we think mechanistically live somewhere past it and downstream circuits. Um, and but I want to come back to this. What I said at the end yesterday is that well, I kind of gave you. I said I did the reverse engineering loop that I built a, an okay model from it to the behavior, which are basically these linear classifiers on the population spaces. But it's not satisfying as a domain of core recognition, which I set up for you as 10 degree images, 200 milliseconds, somehow give rise to behavior, because I'm not giving you yet a model of how you go from these images to these neural responses. I'm just going, I'm giving you models from the neural responses to the behavior that I'm sort of approximating with these classifiers. So now we want to work on what happens between here and here. 
And that is, how are these features computed from the image? Or similarly, what are, what's happening along the way, which are related uh, questions. Um, and as I mentioned, there was, a, there was a bit of a breakthrough for our field in about 2013 that's you know, in, improved since then. And I'm going to kind of tell you that that's what I'm going to spend most of today talking about that story and where, where it's evolved to over the last five years or so. So that really goes under this model of how can, how, or this sort of topic of how can we model that is at least approximate the computations in silicon that exist between the images and the IT responses themselves. Okay. So, um, everybody with me? Questions? Okay. Everybody see where I'm going? Yes? Should I go? Somebody said quarter speed. I think I'm maybe only about half speed right now. Is this okay? Yes. Whoever? Yeah, okay. So usually, if someone wants me to go faster, that's okay, too. So, it's, it's, uh, so I'm trying to hit the median. So, um, okay. So, this is, um, this is to get you started. Um, Davide showed some of this in his nice introduction yesterday where he showed you know, Tanaka's work. This is our version of uh, Tanaka's work. It's like you're, you're a physiologist, you go record a neuron, let's say an IT, you record it, you measure its response to a whole bunch of images. I showed you we measure you know, thousands of images. I'm showing you 1,600 images here. This is not time. These are, this is the response, that mean response averaged over 50 repetitions um, to a bunch of image, images. And I've grouped them by the category that use, was used to generate the images. So it was asked a minute ago of like, do you use one chair? There's actually eight chairs in this category. You can kind of see that here. This chair is actually not the same chair, but they're all within the chair category. So there's actually like there's eight chairs, there's eight faces, there's eight, there's like eight of each in this particular set. And then there's many images of each with by rendering the different parameters and placing them on random backgrounds. So you end up with these big large image chats, which I showed you some with the I showed you them yesterday with the face and the plane and so forth and the car and these funny scenes. But here you get some four more examples of them. And you can always see some it might be hard for you to even notice there's a chair there. So that variability of difficulty is something we take advantage of at the behavior level, as you saw already. But here I want you to focus on the neural response to say, look, this neuron kind of, this is its response. And again, this is not time. This is just a funny way of plotting the data. These could be bar plots you know, or dots. They're just hard. This is, makes it a little easier for you to see because there's a lot of numbers here. Um, and you can squint at this. And this is what people like Tanaka and others would do for, you know, people would take uh, a stare at this and say, I think this neuron is doing something. And then they'll try to change the stimulus to say, I think it's sort of a chair neuron or a face neuron. And then they'll reduce it in some way to try to see if they can kind of confirm that hypothesis. So you could look at this and say, at first glance, this is kind of a chair neuron if you stare at it, right? Because look, I, I could fit it with a function that's sort of flat, step, flat, down, flat. And that would be, you know, that's my version of when you say it's a chair neuron, that's what its response pattern could be because that's your model as you presenting it to me is it likes chairs and therefore it doesn't like anything else and it likes all chairs equally. Well, you can see that's un, that model is actually clearly falsified by these data because it doesn't like that image of a chair and it really likes these ones. Um, and well, it sometimes likes planes better than some chairs and boats better than chairs. So you can see it's sort of not fair to the poor IT neuron to call it a chair neuron. It might make humans happy to call it a chair neuron, but it's clearly not a chair neuron. Okay, I hope you guys can see that. Okay, so um, here's a more famous IT neuron. This is a so-called face neuron. Again, you could squint at this and put a flat line and a step and across and down, and you'd call it. It would kind of if you had to put it in one of these categories. Then yes, face neuron is your best model of this neuron, and chair is your best model of this neuron. But you can see again, it's not fair to the poor. IT neuron that, well, it doesn't like that face. It really likes that face. Sometimes it likes some animals better than faces and, or some planes better than faces. So, so you see there's structure in here that isn't captured by those simple models. So again, you probably heard of face neurons, but there are no face neurons in IT. Those are human crutches um, because we don't have other words to, to describe them. And so what I'm going to try to give you today is we, we're not necessarily going to use words, but we're going to use algorithms that can produce better approximations of what these responses look like. Here's a V4 neuron just to also set the stage. Um, if you record from V4 and you try to put it in categories that I showed you, it's even harder. And that's why you know, it's, people talk about IT face and chair and hand neurons, but they don't talk about V4 hand and face and chair neurons. Because it's like now it's really clear that this is in some crazy feature space that it doesn't map to the human semantic categories. 
as well, which is probably a clue that this is getting close to needing to support chairs and face and so forth, but it's just not quite all the way there. And this one's even more hidden in the middle of the network. And if you look at it plotted against the same categories, chairs and faces and <laughs> so forth, you see that, wow, it's really, really complicated. I, I can't even fit one of those sort of step functions to it. So you might start looking for edges or curves, and those are the things that people have tried to do. Um, a number of studies have tried to sort of figure out other words like curves and edges that might satisfy this neuron. But again, it's a complicated response. So this is kind of what the field uh, looked like for a long time, for actually many decades, of people staring at these things and trying to come up with these uh, language-driven models of things, and some of them a, a little more than language, I should say, I should, to, be, to be fair. Um, but so what happened more recently is that people have come up with algorithms from neural networks that can actually explain these things quite well. And so the story, you know, again, if you step back, is there's measurements, but those alone are hard to interpret, as I just showed you. So you need to start modeling this in some way to try to explain those measurements better. And, and so the models that I'm going to show you, they're not models of a full behaving organism like uh, Chris showed or that Peter was just thinking about in his work where you're actually going to have to make an action. These are dust models that are trying to take the image and process it in some way. Now, technically, there's some actions, but the models, for instance, aren't pressing buttons or they're not doing those choices there. We kind of add that machinery on top of the models for them. The models that we're playing with just take an image and try to process it to a better form of representation to support pressing images, strictly to support putting linear classifiers on the top end to say it's a bird and not an elephant. Um, and so the models kind of take as their input, it's like this is their whole world, is this part of the visual scene here, and they try to process it to a space that can support linear classification. So those models that I'm going to show you, they're not just sort of pulled out of the ether. In fact, this is one of the most interesting intersections between current machine learning and AI and, um, and brain and cognitive sciences. It's that over many decades, um, neuroscience and to some extent cognitive science influenced the shaping of current deep networks by making a lot of measurements, beginning with the work of Hubel and Weasel on you know, edge cells within V1. But I kind of also highlighted here a number of things that are all relevant to current deep networks that essentially came out of neuroscience first. And so these are when people say things are brain inspired in these networks, these are some of the most important things. So um, in the interest of, I, I usually kind of go through these just quickly, but I'm gonna maybe take a little time today so we can to go through them. So first of all, we think of um, any step of the visual process here which known, if you go in neuroscience textbooks for decades, and again, Hubel and Weasel, um, that you don't, you don't go, like, you don't take a part of the LGN and have a V1 neuron integrate over all of the LGN. It has some local processing within the LGN. That's called, it's measured operationally, it's as a receptive field, and the anatomy supports that as well, as I've sort of schematized here. And similarly, you go to V2, it doesn't integrate over all of V1, it sort of has some local region of V1 that it draws input for. So again, there's a spatially local processing that can be approximated with a linear filter with a simple nonlinearity, like a threshold nonlinearity after it. Those are some of the standard so-called LN models of the visual system, and I'll show you some drawings of those in a minute. Um, the other next concept where people get hung up on is the notion of convolution. So you, you've heard of convolutional neural networks, and I'm going to show you them next. And neuroscientists often say, the brain doesn't do convolution, so therefore convolutional neural networks are wrong. But <laughs> They're forgetting that you just open up any neuroscience textbook and there's an implicit assumption that whatever I'm doing here in V1, like say I've got an oriented edge here, I assume there's some other V1 neuron processing this other part of the visual field that also has a similar oriented edge. So I'm going to do edge, I'm going to do edge extraction repeated over the image. Now, the brain does not do that by taking a filter and convolving it over the LGN output but that's how you can better implement it in a, in a system. And so that's why people run these as convolutional on machines. But the neuroscientist version is you just do a parallel set of filters implemented in parallel rather than actually running a convolution. But algorithmically, they're trying to do exactly the same thing. There's important details there of like, is this edge, this edge exactly the same as this edge? 
In a convolutional model, the answer is yes. In the real brain, the answer is probably not exactly. So in the convolutional model, it's, it's, this is called weight sharing. Because you're, because you're going to do convolution, it's as if you copied the filter weights here all the way over there magically somehow. And of course, the brain doesn't do that. But again, if you think about the brain learning or evolving, that whatever it's doing here, if you assume it's doing the same thing here, and the statistics of the world are reasonably stationary over space, then you will get something that's approximating weight sharing. So um, these, are, these are examples of things that are going to be in these networks that actually are also, to some form, exist in neuroscience textbooks. They're just usually not implemented or called convolutions in a neuroscience textbook. Threshold nonlinearities are already mentioned. Um, nonlinear pooling, where you take the outputs and you normalize within a local region um, or a slightly larger region, are, are key ideas in, in, uh, in current neural networks that are also key ideas within Brain, brain and cognitive sciences, especially visual processing, the idea of normalization. Um, and then this notion of this so-called deep neural networks. The original deep neural network, I like to say, is the ventral visual stream. I'm already showing it to you as a deep network. All the textbooks say this for decades. You have this deep network. I showed you the history of the anatomy that gets us to why we stack those things in a particular way. Um, and it also tells us there's about four cortical layers, as I've shown you here, maybe six, depending how you break IT. Um, but like roughly four cortical layers. So it's not 100. It's more like something like four or less than 10. Um, and I have also been talking about this largely feed-forward processing. I showed you the latency data that it gradually increases from 60 to 70 to 80 to 90 to more like 100 milliseconds. Which, but, and so you, within 100 milliseconds, so you have this gradual progression, which implies it's mostly feed-forward. And that you, it is only 100 milliseconds, which is quite a very fast amount of time, which means there isn't a lot of time for other brain areas and recurrent circuits to even be engaging in the first place. So those are the kinds of pieces of evidence that sort of say, look, a feed-forward model is a reasonably starting point approximation for what's going on in the brain's deep network for vision. Um, another key idea is population rate codes. In neuroscience, this has been somewhat mostly ignored in the field of vision because of the way Hubel and Weasel started it. In the other sensory fields, especially somatosensory, um, the idea of population codes exists more naturally. The, what I've been showing you already, that you don't think of neurons as living in isolation, doing a job on their own, but as part of a group of neurons that together can support a behavior. Um, and so that idea, again, you, you saw me present that in the first part of the talk. That idea has been around for a while. It's also important in current deep neural networks. And I already mentioned solution computed in about 100 milliseconds. These are just some of the things that are, um, that are in current um, networks that are, were in textbooks of neuroscience for several um, decades to one form or another. So that's a bit of background. Um, but then we had networks. They didn't just start five years ago. So people have been building networks to try to approximate how the visual system is handling this to do task-like recognition um, really for many decades as well. And I think the, the most famous network that really starts the thread that meets today's current thread is the network by uh, Fukushima. Um, and I, without taking you through the, all the details of this, the, the key idea is, again, they implement these ideas of local processing. And they have this sort of gradual buildup of simple cells, complex cells, simple cells, complex cells. That's what these S's and C's and S's and C's mean here. And so what they're doing intuitively is trying to build up selectivity which is the simple cell part, like edge features. And Davide showed you this trade off between selectivity and variance. So you build up selectivity of, say, to different orientations. And then you build up some invariance to position and scale, like a complex cell with a, a little bit of pooling operations. And that's the complex. But you don't have invariance over the whole visual field. You just get a little bit of local invariance and a little bit of selectivity. And then you go to the next step, and you do it again, repeat, repeat, repeat. The difficulty is exactly how you choose to build those selectivities and those, uh, those tolerances is not specified by the brain data or by these models well. So the sort of core ideas were there, um, but how to do it was not yet clear. Um, Tommy Pojo's group extended that class in a class of models called the HMAX class. Um, this is basically the Fukushima models, except um, much more detail, more mapping to the brain. Um, and uh, one of the, it's called the HMAX class because that complex cell step was a pooling um, and, and a maximum operator. And that's, that's where the max is in the name. So when you build a complex cell, it's like a maximum response of the simple cell responses within a region of visual space. And um, maybe I feel like maybe you guys, um, I don't know, maybe it's worth spending a little time on this uh, just because I don't have slides of this. But um, if I have a bunch of simple cells that have a similar orientation and then I have a complex cell, it's just going to take the, all the outputs of those cells 
and decide I want to take whatever the maximum response is within that pool of local cells, I'm going to report that as my output. So this is a complex layer and this is a simple cell layer. And you would imagine that you would have another complex cell. This is for this orientation. Another type of complex cell for another type of orientation as a, as a, as a similar idea. So that is how you build up kind of invariances in these kind of simple complex networks from Fukushima and then the HMAX class. This is hopefully by way of background to just give you a feel for how these models had been evolving for over the last couple decades. Um, I, don't, I don't really want to dwell on that for too long because um, just a bit of history perspective. Um, then uh, and when, when my lab started working in this area, Dave Cox, Nicholas Pinto, um, these were uh, graduate students in the lab at the time. We decided to take a tack of let's let the machines start doing our work for us. So one of the challenges of those networks is there's a lot of free parameters, as you might imagine. It's like, how big is this? You know, exactly how do I do the operator? What, what features should I use here? There's a ton of free parameters that, that are consistent with these neuroscience constraints when you build these networks. And we said, let's start just searching that space of parameters for architectural strategies that turn out to be better or not. And so that's what we did here with basically GPUs searching large classes of architectures to find ones that were tended to be high performing. I won't um, dwell on the output of that work just to tell you that the main idea is you start to let, again, machines do the searching for you rather than one graduate student tuning up a model over three or four years, which is how it was working before that. Um, and then I want to tell you, spend time, really the next bulk of my time rest of today is talking about a model um, and a follow-up set of models that um, is really sort of a deep neural network that was, this was the version that we built in our lab called HMO. You probably haven't heard of HMO, it, but it, it doesn't matter. It stands for Hierarchical Modular or, or Organization, which was a way of putting together architectures to do performance on these tasks. And I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But just to say it follows in this long thread of the Fukushima class of models, the HMAX class of models, and then this class of models. So um, I'm going to tell you about that today. It was done by a graduate student um, Ha Hung and my postdoc at the time, Dan Yeamans, who I mentioned yesterday, is now assistant professor at Stanford. So this is HMO. Um, it is a feed-forward deep neural network. It has four uh, layers on it um, that we, I roughly call V1, V2, V2, V4, IT. So we were using four because every talk we'd give would say, look, there's roughly four things just like I gave to you, so let's build it to approximate that. So uh, I say that this network is neurosciences constrains is a constraining the macro architecture that is those four layers um, um, things like that you have the convolution across space that is you take the same filter type and you copy it across space here um, and um, and then I, me I mentioned also some of the sort of the the meso architecture about things like uh, doing uh, dot products followed by non nonlinearities with some normalization this is Mateo Carandini and David Heger these are again older ideas of how which should what um, V1, for instance, does, and presumably V2 and V4 as a cortical module, is take linear models followed by some nonlinearities with some normalization. We didn't implement this exactly, um, but these family of models are not far from implementing things uh, like this. So I'm putting this up to, again, to make a connection to some existing neuroscience. So let me try to, on this slide, go through very, this very slowly about what this, what am I actually showing on this. But let me put a pause here to make sure everybody's on the, any questions at this point. Okay, yes. I have one question. So you said that there are four layers, but it looks like there are a further finer division of the layers, some layers. Yes, so I, that's what I was about to go through. So, so, so look, so again, I, I wish I don't have great slides of this, so I can draw it on the board, but I'm going to try to tell you here. So there's four planes, as David A said here. You guys see those four planes, right? Those planes, each, consider them each of having lots of neurons, thousands of simulated neurons, neurons in quotes, in those planes. So these neurons, first of all, I should say, they're analog units, right? There's no spikes. They just compute a number, a real number, negative, it can be negative to you know, negative to positive. It's, there's no constraints on them. They're just real valued output units. So in that sense, that's why I'm using neurons in quotes, because they're not spiking neurons. We think of them as approximating the rates of real neurons. And so as Davide pointed out, there's four planes there that I'm showing. If I take that you know, V1 that I have there, it sort of looks like this. So think of those as like this is, all of these are filter type that. All of these are filter type that. All of these are filter type this. And all of these are filter type, I don't know if I've drawn them all. That's like you have four different types of filters. And you have spatial copies of them across the visual field. That's what's being sort of simulated or just kind of schematized 
by this drawing here. So you might start asking questions, why four? Why not eight? Why not 20? Right? How big are these receptive fields? Right? Those are some of the parameter details that um, we're going to optimize for you next. Um, and in this case, I'm showing four, but the model actually had more than four. I mean, the original model, I think, had uh, something like 20. I can't even remember in the first layer um, here of V1. And I probably don't remember because this, this detail doesn't actually matter that strongly. Um, but one thing you should see is that notice in the next layer there's more of these planes and then even more of these planes and then even more. So the number of so-called filter types is increasing as you go deeper. And that's, that should kind of be obvious to you, right? Because I can sort of start to take mixtures of these things. And, and what I'm doing is as I take mixtures of different, uh, different layers, um, uh, uh, different uh, uh, V2 takes mixtures of V1. Um, whatever mixture I choose to take here, I take the same mixture here. So again, I'm going to copy that across space. But you see, as I do this, I can take more and more complicated mixtures, which should fit your intuition of complicated sets of pixels. I could end up with very complicated uh, combinations of things. But I'm also doing it over a locally spatial region, which is gradually collapsing my spatial axes, which is why you see this these things getting smaller in this direction. So the, sort of, the neurons are devoting themselves more to the feature dimensions, which on the first level are like things like oriented edges. And the later level are hard to describe because they're linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear combinations of a deep stack of things. So they're a very complicated nonlinear function of the image. But the key thing you should have in mind is there's more features at the end than the beginning, and there's less space at the end than the beginning. But there's still a little bit of a map there, even, even when you get towards the deepest step of, of IT, as shown here. Because you don't have fully connected layers, um, at the, you still have some spatial copying across the field. I don't know if that makes sense so far. I should probably go slower. I think I hopefully answered your question, Davide. Um, um, do you guys, does this, do you guys, does this make sense? Should I do more on this? Anybody need, want me to go in more? Why don't I show you some results and then we can come back to like, wait, what's going on in that part of the model about specific questions? But hopefully you get the gist of this model. It's like linear, nonlinear, copied across space. Um, and um, I guess that's sort of the main things I want you to get. OK, but I've also been saying, there's a lot of parameters here, like even these oriented edges. Like, why did you choose oriented edges? First of all, in HMO, we didn't choose oriented edges. We're, we're going to let the model choose it, the parameters choose it for me. If you think about this linear oper this operator right here, that's basically its pixel combination on the input. It has some pluses and some minuses over some pixel field. That's what's being shown there. Why did I choose the pixels, that, the, those weights that way? Those are called the weights of the linear operators that you choose here. So those are free parameters, among many other free parameters, like, well, how did you set the ReLU and the normalization, these kind of output parameters here. There's a ton of free parameters in these models. And again, neuroscience doesn't tell you. I'm not going to, the natural thing for people to do is say, let's take some neural data and fit the neural data, use all the, use the neural data to sort of fit the parameters so that I can fit the neural responses. And then I'll, that'll be a model of every neuron. I do that for many, many neurons. And then I'll get my answer of what's going on. That's, that's kind of the classic bottom-up approach, but it gets very hard because pretty quickly you run out of neural data. So we took a different approach, and this is really, I think, the main contribution of this work, is that we sort of did an approach that actually also exists in other parts of the field. We're just doing it for this particular problem at a much bigger scale than was done. Um, the approach is essentially, let's assume something more like ethology, that this network isn't designed by evolution to build neurons that physiologists record. It's designed to do something greater, let us perform some kind of task to survive in the world. What task would we want to make it do? Well, we, we're not going to try to build a full robot here to walk around and pick things up and so forth. So we said, let's pick the task that we kind of already thought the ventral stream was doing, which was this core recognition task, which is to be able to identify categories invariant to things like position scale, pose, background, so forth, all the things that I talked about yesterday. So we sort of said, let's pick a task that, again, was you know, originally inspired by cognitive science and other things, things that I briefly mentioned to you yesterday, of like, why do you even need a visual system to perform these kind of tasks? But let's take this seriously as an engineer and just say, let's just not imagine the task, but let's actually optimize the parameters of the network to actually perform this task. 
So now when you start, when I phrase it this way, you say, well, but this is a neuroscientist telling me he knows this stuff about the brain, but there's a lot of stuff he doesn't know. So he has this kind of model, which is basically a big model family. And then he thinks this part of the brain does this thing. And so you put those two together and you say, well, let's just optimize within this family to find parameters of this model, uh, that is, choose a particular model within the model family that will do the thing that you say you want it to do. And so this is an assumption. This is a general family of models. And then you use a bunch of applied math and computer science tricks to actually tune the parameters. And I'm saying it this way because I don't think any of the so-called, you could call this learning because we're finding parameters inside a network. Some of them look like synapses in the network or could be mapped to synapses. Some of them look more like anatomy parameters. Um, I don't think that what we're doing here has really much, if, in my mind, probably almost nothing to do with the actual learning of what's going on here in the brain. It's really a trick to just an engineering trick to get the thing to be near the space that does this task well within the model family. Okay, so that's how you should think about that optimization. So I'm telling you all this, and maybe I should give you the punchline, is when you put these three ingredients together, so architecture, which is here, task, which is here, and optimizer, which is here, then you, you know, these are actually the sort of core elements of any machine learning system. If you, you know, listen to Yashua Benjua talk or anybody talk about machine learning, they'll talk about something like this, some sort of task, which is usually called the cost function. Um, and then some sort of optimization, which is usually called the learning rule. So uh, you put these three elements together, and this is a general framing for all of machine learning. And here I'm giving you a specific version of this for the ventral stream. Here the task is core recognition. Here the architecture is something about the ventral stream anatomy and physiology, as I described to you. And then there's an optimizer, which again, maybe uh, machine learning people really like this part. Again, I don't think this part has anything to do with what's going on in the brain. This will be a, a fun discussion. But What's cool is when you put these three ingredients together, then the neurons that you get in the middle of this network look an awful darn lot like the neurons that I showed you that we couldn't predict or explain before. And that's what I'm going to show you next. So you put these ingredients together, stir it up, poof, a network pops out, a neural network. And you then say, well, how does this network look like this brain network? And I'm going to show you how we make those comparisons. And they look remarkably similar. And so that is the kind of main take home message here. So one way to think about this is that what we're doing is there's a set of parameters here. And every time we fix the parameters, it's like we've birthed a new organism. It's like a new artificial visual system. It's like you're running some sort of evolution in the computer. Again, that's, I'm using the word evolution instead of developmental learning because we are not trying to say that this is what's going on in the brain yet. Um, we're just saying we're getting to an end point that we evolved it through a computer, through this process, and we're comparing that adult endpoint to the observed adult endpoint that we measure in the non-human primate. So get evolution. What does it evolve to? I already sort of showed you that, well, it evolves to something that is much more like the brain than any network that we had, you know, HMAX, Fukushima, our models, much more like the brain than anything that had been built before. And that's what I'm going to show you next. So how do we know it looks like the brain? Well, we're going to say, we're going to now say, because this is a neural network, I can make a mapping between neurons in this network and neurons that I measured in the brain and ask how similar they look. And this is where things get really interesting and forward looking as to how we as a field, and I don't mean we, I mean the royal we, should be making these kind of comparisons. So I'll show you how we've made these comparisons so far. But I want to pause here to remind you, remember way back the first slide of the talk, I said, we got to build with neural networks. Remember that when I was talking about reverse engineering and neural networks? This is why you want to build with neural networks, because your model can be mapped to the brain. If this was a bunch of probability equations and so forth, like you'd see in a lot of computer vision models up to time, I would have to make a huge number of assumptions of somehow those map to the brain. Here I have many less assumptions because I'm building with hardware that is not that far from the model of this hardware. So from the very outset, the architectural space is reasonably in line with the architectural space that the physiologists are measuring. And that was, again, by construction of these things. And that's what's exciting to me about the, what's going on in our field right now is that people used to do with computer vision with probabilities and hand-tuned features and their ways of thinking about things. And I'm like, well, that's great. They're doing something. And now they're doing computer vision with neural networks. And like, well, now they're actually generating hypotheses that may be relevant to the brain. So the fields are now working together because they're building with tools that are not far from the hardware 
that we are measuring. And I don't mean they're exact copies of neurons, but they're much closer than they used to be. So that's one of the most exciting things going on right now. Not that we've solved the problem, but that we're building with hypotheses that are relevant to neuroscience. So um, let's, now let's do this mapping. So again, I said this is a neural network. It has neurons, analog rate neurons. This is a neural network. It has spiking neurons that I convert to analog rate neurons by averaging over time, as I showed you yesterday. And now we can ask, what, does this IT look like that IT? So let me sort of, this is the fun part here to, I think, have a discussion. So how, I've kind of given you the answer a little bit here, but how, how do you guys think we should compare? If I told you that like, this network has an IT that looks like the monkey's IT, what, what are the ways you can think of to compare? Does anybody want to offer up some ideas? Representational power. Representational power. OK, so what do you mean by that? Uh, so we have two ITs, and we're going to just do something with each of them. Right, so you, I think he, to translate it so everybody can hear, he's saying, how do the feature set that come out of the two ITs, the simulated IT and the actual IT, how good are they at doing a bunch of categorization tasks? And now good, probably you need to put, cl put linear classifiers on and you can kind of do all those kind of things, right? And, and I should say, it's like, remember, this thing was actually optimized to do that, which essentially, there's, this is the softmax layer. This is the linear classifier step in the model. So it's already, we know how good this is and we can make those comparisons in absolute terms. I didn't have the slide up here, but on an average, that was why we knew we were in good shape because we'd gotten these networks to be near human level performance on these kind of tasks. So we sort of already knew that going in at sort of a mean level now, but there's some other things that can be done like behavioral details of, well, how, what are the patterns of errors that you get out of those that, that would be in line with the kind of things that you're saying. So these are behavioral level measurements of both systems in effect, right? One is you take its IT and you linear classify it and you get its behavior, and the other is you take the actual IT and you linear classify it and you get its behavior. And those are sort of indirect measures of the similarity between the systems. So it's one way to do it. It's not the most direct way, but it is one way that you could do it. So that's a fine answer. I saw some other hands. Uh, yeah. Yeah, good question. So I didn't, I said kind of science has the tax. I just meant in general, they were saying invariant recognition is something that humans do very well. So let's get machines to do that well. And it was sort of that level of setting the task. It didn't mean, another version would be, I see humans perform this prep, where they make this error on this image, and this error on this image, and this error on this image, and so you should optimize something to for, perform those, all those exact same errors. That would be another version of what I said, but that's not what I meant. Well, so again, it's more of an aspirational goal here. It's like, try to be like a human. Please do your best to do this invariant recognition task and optimize your parameters as best you can to do that. And then the answer to this question here was like, actually, once we optimize the parameters and we compare with humans on the performance, it was in the game. So it was about human level on these tasks, or percent accuracy overall. And so I just mean it in that very aspirational sense of please try to be good at this. And if you are good at that, then let's look at your internals to see if your insides look like my insides. So, so what I'm talking about now is how do we judge we have two insides, a model and a brain, how do we compare their insides in a way that's sort of fair to say one is like the other? And that's kind of what we're trying to talk about next. So I see two hands. Yes, go ahead. Maybe we can, maybe we can measure just Yes, but so how do I, if I have, I showed you some examples of neurons that I pulled out. I said, look, here's a face neuron, here's a chair neuron, but there's a lot of neurons, right? There's, let's say there's a thousand. So I need a way to compare a thousand things. So I need to sort of deal with that problem still, right? Because all I have is an IT, I have two bags of neurons, right? I have a bag of simulated IT so and a, problem. yeah, there's a, there's a mapping problem, <laughs> right? Right, and so that makes you start thinking about, the reason I'm having this discussion, it makes you think about interesting questions of how do I know your IT is like my IT? How do I know one monkey's IT is like another IT? What, what are fair ways to even assess whether there is such a thing as IT? Right, and so, you know, I have my particular view on that, which, you know, the simplest view would be like, we all have neuron 1269 in each of our heads. Like we have a cop, we, like my copies of neurons are exactly in your head. And start thinking like, that sounds, 
possible, but sounds a little bit extreme, right? At, at some point, that doesn't sound quite right, that we're exact copies in that way. What really what we want is something more like an algorithmic copy, which is, hey, we share an encoding space of the world. So we might have, like, we span the same encoding dimensions, but our axes of spanning could be rotated. So our neurons are now like linear copies of each other, right? So that's another version of what it means to be the same, right? These are different types of similarity, and which would be assessed with different metrics. So the metric we used originally was essentially that kind of spanning metric where I say, look, if, if this, and that's what I was doing here, if this, if there's a neuron, let's say that face neuron, if it exists here, I don't expect that exact face neuron that we happen to pull out in monkey 12 to exist in this network 16, but I should be able to take network 16 and build linear combinations of its network that can predict the neuron in monkey 12, as if monkey 12 lives within the, span, the linear span of network 16. Just I'm throwing numbers 16 and 12 to say there's many monkeys and many possible networks. So we're going to try to build linear maps from here to here and say, oh, build a map. Uh oh, I have free parameters again, right? There's a map. There are weights that need to be determined to build that map and to establish the correspondence. So I need to start using some of my, I didn't use any neural data up till here other than historical perspective data as I described for you. But now I'm gonna take some of the neural data which is the actual responses of that, let's call it the face neuron just to fix ideas, take some of the images randomly selected to build this linear mapping from these features, these neurons to that neuron. So it's a sort of many features to one prediction. And then I'm gonna ask how well that mapping does on held out images of the actual neuron, how it can predict the future responses of the real neuron to images that I didn't use to build the mapping. Does that, does that make you guys with me? This is kind of a key step. You have this artificial network, you wanna say it's the same, you build a linear map, and then you test it with some held out stuff. And then you can do games like, what do I hold out? Maybe I only show it faces and I test it on cars. Or maybe I only show it cars and I test it on faces. Or maybe I do it randomly, which is what I'm going to show you next, where I just randomly sample from that space and I randomly test on held out images. And I'll show you versions of different cuts on those. Those are called the training test split now. Not training in the sense of training this full network, but training in the sense of building the map from the network to the brain. Yes. Yeah, well, actually, so I can tell you, let's say there's thousands of units in here, and I already told you there's 10 million units here. So whether it's lower dimensional or not is itself a very interesting question that I wasn't ready to get into yet. In ambient dimensionality, like total dimensionality, it's actually lower dimensional because I just said thousands and millions. In reality, I have hundreds and thousands because I have hundreds of samples. Um, but the actual deeper question is, what are the true dimensionalities of these two spaces? And that's another way to make the comparison, which is you know, a more interesting way that, that's sort of more current directions. I think Davide are gonna talk about some of that in his lab right. this afternoon, right? Because that, that's actually not captured by this kind of metric that I described for you, which is you're basically just saying, is this neuron live within the space of the dimensions? And you, you've actually sort of already, to me, uncovered one of the ways that this comparison metric is still not a fully satisfying metric because if I had a big, huge neural network, whoops, I could, I could have a very over complete space here that I could still satisfy a prediction here. And in that sense, you wouldn't want to declare these as being, this being a copy of that. It's more like it's a superset of that. And this linear mapping metric that I'm showing you does not guard against that superset possibility. It just says that it's within the span of it to the extent it works. I don't know if I, I took your question and detoured it into my own little little yeah, tirade, so maybe you. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's still not the same model, but you can get from there to there using a setup. Well, that's what I, I haven't shown you any results yet, but that is the idea of, I just wanted to set the stage for like, what am I gonna try to do to make these similarities? Um, because, and then you guys may kind of, I'll show you two ways of doing similarity, and I've sort of described one of them and then I'll show you one more. But this is the one we use for much of what's published, so I'm showing it to you first. And it's nice because it connects naturally to what I showed you earlier. It's like, here's that chair neuron. And now I'm showing these images, and I'm using a bunch of other images that I didn't show here to build the linear mapping. And then I'm gonna show you the prediction. And that's the prediction of the ANN model simulated IT neuron as a weighted combination of its IT features to fit this observed IT neuron. These are like predictions, these images, again, it didn't see any of these images. 
In fact, the network itself never even saw these objects when it trained that full network that I showed you was doing the classification test. So, so there's sort of two training data. One is what did you build the darn network on? And then what is the second is what did you use to build the mapping of the network to the brain? And here I'm holding out um, images that it, that it didn't see to do this mapping. So I want you to see, like, if you look at this, like, you can see it's not perfect, but it's sort of actually getting a lot of the structure within this here. So it's like, yeah, it's not a chair neuron either. It's sort of not anything. It's hard to describe it in words, but it's fitting the data quite well. In fact, um, you know, we can show this. But you can see it's also not perfect. This black here is higher than that red, and that looks lower. You can see this thing is not perfect. Um, here's this face neuron. Uh, yeah, OK. And then here's the simulated face neuron. Or again, face is a short face in quotes. It's not really a face neuron. But you can see it actually captures the structure again quite well. Um, and um, so I'll show it to you there. So again, we can quantify this in terms of we quantify this in kind of explainable variance. It really, it's a you know, predictable variance. This is all held out variance that's reproducible, that is, again, not due, not due to neural noise, that we, that's irreducible variance in our data. And a fraction of reproducible variance that is explained on average, and, and these two examples are about that. This is what a 50% explained variance looks like. Um, it's about half of the explainable variance is explained, which is actually quite good. Old models like HMAX and others were actually around 20%, and I'll show you that in a minute. So when I said we had a breakthrough, I mean, the models were like pathetic. And then they had this huge jump um, once we started building things this way. And that's what I meant by saying there was a breakthrough. So now we were immediately up to sort of over 50% of the variance explained by this particular strategy of optimizing networks and then taking out neurons and comparing them with these high-level visual areas. It's not just the highest level IT. And again, I'll show you all this in quantified, but I want to first show you another example. This is V4. Um, this is that neuron I showed you earlier. And here is the model. Now it gets more interesting because its IT layer, here's its best fit from the IT layer. You can see it's, you know, it's kind of falling, but it's actually not that good. This best fit comes out of this so-called V4. It's layer three, which I called, quote, it's V4, in, which is shown here in red. So this is a combination of layer three features fitting the, v, the, uh, the, I, the V4 neuron. And I should have said this. The V4 data are just copied in the background here so you can see it four times. The red is what's differing on these plots. So you can see this red, if you eyeball it, is actually the best out of the four. Um, and that's what I'm trying to say here. And that turned out to be true on average, as I'll show you in the next slide. But again, even neurons that are hard to explain with human words are reasonably well predicted. Again, I think this is about half of the explainable variance. That was the 2013 number. We were doing a little better with old models, so the jump was not as big for V4, 20, 30 to 50 instead of 20 to 50. <laughs> Here's what I just said, now quantified over all sites. So this is like 100 V4 sites and 100 IT sites. This is median explained variance fraction. So remember, I just said about 50%. That's what you're seeing here. And the top layer of the HMO model was the best at explaining IT, which is maybe not surprising to you. It didn't have to be that way. And then, they, then it goes, if you look at earlier layers, they don't explain IT as well. And then here's the V4 layer. And this was especially interesting to us because the top layer was not the best. The middle layer was kind of the best. Both middle layers were pretty good. And then it falls off again in the first layer. So this is one way that we can kind of come up with a match score over all our samples of neurons. It's like an average or median explainable variance fraction. Um, here's those control models that I mentioned to you, by the way, HMAX. PLOS09 was that model search that I mentioned from my lab where we were doing architectural searches. They were pretty good, but nowhere near as what these models could produce. And since, and since we have time in this group, I want to highlight there's another model on here called this category model. This is essentially that kind of trying to be an ideal face neuron model or a car neuron model or a dog neuron, chair neuron model, whatever you want within those categories. Um, and I'm showing you that there because sometimes people look at this and say, well, of course, IT does recognition. And therefore, if you do recognition, these neurons should look like IT. But if you try to model IT neurons, again, as face recognizers or you know, basically outputs of linear classifiers, you, you don't do nearly as well as when you model them as these hidden units that are one step away from linear classifiers but aren't quite yet the linear classifiers. That's what you get if you just model them as like categories themselves in this purple here. Um, and so um, those are other controls for us. But so this is the gap between these models and all these others was when I said there was a breakthrough. That was, in our minds, that's the breakthrough. And things have just continued to improve on this since then. And that's what I'm going to show you on the rest of the talk here. Yes, question. Yeah, so I have a question which is maybe a finite, for 
sure a finer point on mm -hmm. this. I don't know if you want to, you have something to add on that. So, um, you described your argument for uh, the fact that the, the artificial system and the biological system uh, make, you know, we can think of them as spanning the same kind of coding space mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a way to derive our matching uh, mm, procedure. Uh, yep. So, I can follow uh, very well on that, uh, especially in IT, uh, especially following all your arguments that say, oh, you know, things in IT can be considered as being largely, you know, you know assuming that things are encoded linearly, so the spaces should be, you know, should be linear somehow. So you can think of going... Well, the matching between one organism and another should be linear, otherwise it's hard to say what it even means to match, is, a, yeah, is the yeah, core yeah. argument yeah. there, right? If I allow nonlinear matching, then everything equals everything else, right? So I need to draw a line yes. somewhere. Yeah, so, yeah. so that, yeah. because... Uh, I was thinking then, uh, because there's also this other argument that says, oh, if you just consider, you know, the ventral stream, there is this idea that, you know, uh, successive uh, operations are performing this untangling of these representations. So you're thinking of the representations in earlier areas as being more, I mean, less linear, right? Less so linear with respect to IT. Pretty linear with respect yes. to the pixel, right? It sort of depends yeah, exactly. linear with respect to what, right? Yeah, so. Yeah. Okay. so then you still, I mean, okay, but, but then you still seem to get very similar uh, absolute levels of matching between, say, uh, B4 and IT here. So when you say, wait, wait, B4, you mean which thing are you looking at? These two or? Maximum matching between. These two, for instance. Yeah, say uh, HMO level 3 with B4 yep. is the same amount, like it's the as same absolute match as uh, the last layer L of HMO with IT. Oh, but. Okay, but these these okay, but those are nonlinear transforms within the model. So I, I'm not following your logic yeah, exactly. No, no, I'm saying that then this fact kind of supports the idea that approximately uh, the representational spaces are still relatively linear in in V4 as well. Relative uh, to what? Uh, relative to say whether pixel space or, uh, or. Well, this is like again the lower levels don't fit V4 well at all. Here's pixels trying to fit V4. So V4 is not too linear on the pixel space because it can only explain less than 10% of the V4 variance with a pixel model. Yeah, I think, okay, maybe, maybe we can discuss this. I think, um, I just wanted to confirm this. I mean, you are, there are interesting points of like, can, how far can this metric, what kinds of nonlinearities can this metric kind of be sensitive to? Right, and, and which ones are kind of going to hide inside the similarity score? And I think those are important <laughs> scores. So, um, yeah, so I guess that's the problem. But, but this thing breaks down around the Well, I mean, I, you guys, you're, you're kind of obsessing about these exact kind of colors. What I'm obsessing about is what I, when I look at this plot, what bothers me, it's a 50% and not 100%. Right, so like this models, you can kind of glad you you know people like to look at this and go oh success breakthrough. I'm like well, well we got half full here right. It's only halfway up. It should be 100% because I've already removed the noise variance. <laughs> but we'll come back to this question later. So your questions are good ones. They have to do with like whether we're sure IT is before. And I'm looking at this like well we've got this sort of just improvement to 50%. And those are, your questions are me sort of secondary but interesting but you know there's different ways to view these data as half full half empty in that regard so let me um i've got about an hour or half an hour left so i want to kind of keep moving yeah one maybe one more so okay, so in the brain network there are backward ages as well as like the current ages so okay. what are the rules the current sorry i couldn't get current ages current ages like in v1 v2 and v4 uh, yeah, uh, when you say ages sorry i'm not current. getting Oh, re recurrence here? Like these recurrence here? These, yeah, these yeah. backward edges. The, the, remember, this is a schema schematic of the real brain. So that's all I'm showing you here. And this is just to say if I take samples out of the brain and compare their variance fraction to a model, this is what I get. So the model has no recurrence, no feedback. Okay. The model is a feed forward. I should have said that more clearly. If we back up to the model, the model is feed forward only. See these arrows? Feed forward, feed forward, feed forward. This is a feed forward only model. It has no time, right? It just, an image comes in, images, you can think of image comes in, image comes out, image comes out, image comes out. Image, technically, if you implement it, there's some time unrolling here, but it's basically a static thing. And it produces a layout of the data um, at all levels that just one, one set of numbers for each image. So there's no recurrence, there's no time comparison. This is a very basic feed forward model at this point. But in the biological 
In the biological network, there are recurrences and there's time dynamics that I'm not modeling. Remember, how did I get around that? I just averaged over time to give you one number out of IT. So any time dynamics I've collapsed in the way I'm comparing the data, which is when I show the neural data, that, is the, that black dot is the average of that IT neuron's responses over 100 milliseconds. And I showed you that yesterday where I was like, here's a bunch of spikes. I take this big chunky time window. It gives me one number. Tomorrow, we'll break down the, the time scale within IT a bit more to look within the dynamics. And that connects naturally to the questions of recurrence. Um, for now, we were just trying to kind of get the, the model sort of in the space of the, the responses of the neurons with the sort of first order approximation ignoring the recurrence. Yes. Um, these are held out images. So they're cross-validated across images, as I said. But, and we can cross-validate in different ways. Like what do you want to, you know, different training test splits. And I have a slide on that next. OK. This, everything I show you guys, by the way, anytime we make a prediction or an R, it's always cross-validated. The, the, the interesting question is like cross-validated in exactly what way? Like how far is your generalization from what you show me? OK. In this case, you imagine I, I show you a bunch of images. Think of like I might have trained on this and predict on these, right? Because these are just sort of samples of images, right? So, so you could say, well, they all have chairs. But you know, at the pixel level, they're very different. So it, I, what's the distance measure that we should use? But that's what we're cross-validating over here. Um, and I'll show you another slide on that that might, maybe the point will come up again. So let me, let me just jump ahead or try to get to the, um, I think I've kind of given you one of the main punchlines I wanted to give you today. But oh yeah, here it is. So this is another way of comparing neur neurons, brains, and models. And I'm bringing this up because you see this a lot in the human fMRI literature. And so you probably should be familiar with it. Um, and we can do it with the neural data too. It wasn't our preferred metric to start. We, you know, I think there are pros and cons of these metrics. This is called representational dissimilarity analysis. And Nico Krigascorte is the person whose name is most associated with this um, and has done a lot of really nice work on it. So if you're interested in this, I encourage you to read his stuff. Um, here's one review paper from them. Um, but the key idea goes like this. Remember this neural state space that I showed you actually at the beginning of the talk when I showed the faces and the non-faces. Here's the neural state space again, response of neuron one, response of neuron two, response of so there's like three neurons you can imagine recording. And because we can visualize a three-dimensional space. And now here's this image, you know, just schematizes to where it lives in the neural response space of these three images. Here's another image, here's another image. So there's three images. What's nice about this is you can then think of the distances here. Somebody yesterday asked a question about Euclidean distance. I don't, maybe that was you, right? So this is where that really matters when we compute distances between them of how you want to compute that. But what I'm doing this is you could imagine here's a model and um, it has features, neuron one, neuron two, or neuron three. So I call that features. It could be neuron in quotes from a model. And you can see what I've drawn here is like I'm trying to draw these as if they're the same in the terms of preserving the distances between the images inside the representation. And that's essentially what representational dissimilarity tries to do is to compute the pairwise distances. Um, and you can do that between images or between categories. Again, you can, you can do this in various ways. Um, and then you can ask how do the distance matrix computed here compares with the distance matrix computed here. So you end up with a matrix of distances, a matrix of distances, and then have a similarity, a distance of distances, which is the similarity judgment. Here's examples of matrices um, from, this is monkey IT, this is our IT data using the representational dissimilarity metric of Krigus Gorte. Um, this is distances. And a couple of things you should look at when you look at these plots here. So these are a bunch of images of each category. Um, you see these kind of blocky structures here in blue. Blue means nearby. Red means far in dis distance. I'm sorry, I don't have a scale bar. And this blocky structure means like, you know, animals tend to be near other animals and boats need to be, tend to be near other boats and cars, need, cars and faces near faces. That block diagonal structure is, means you're already set up pretty well to do categorization, which is why when you look at those neurons and say it's kind of a face-like neuron. There's a lot of neurons that are sort of like that. That means that you end up with these kind of block diagonal structures. But so, so that's sort of the categorization information sort of reflected there. But you see there's all this kind of off-diagonal structure about distances that is reasonably well captured within, these are the model IT units um, from the HMO model. Um, and you, know, you can see that these look you know, visually very similar. And then we can go ahead and do a correlation of this. And that's what you're plotting over here. And here's the HMO. Here's all those other models in gray that I showed you earlier. Again, there was a big jump here. And this is the max possible variance given this particular comparison metric, again, trying to remove the noise from this 
simulation. So this is a way, another way of comparing um, one representation with another called representational dissimilarity analysis. And again, Krigus Gorte, Ode Olivia, Jack Gallant, Jatandra Malik, Justin Gardner, these are all people using fMRI studies in humans to make these comparisons. I've also seen groups doing this with things like you know, ECOG or other measurements as a way of using RDMs to compare deep neural networks with these other types of brain measurements. Um, to the question of general, you asked about this. So this is a version of this. So this is what these RDMs look like when you build them, um, um, when you, when you um, build the mapping. So I should have mentioned the way we're building the HMO is like these are these simulated HMO IT neurons once they've been mapped to the brain. And now we can do that mapping using held out categories, which is at the bottom, or held out images, which is what I was showing you at the beginning, or held out objects, which is in the middle. So these are different types of training test splits. I think this was your question. And I think you can see category generalization is the hardest one to do, and that's the worst performing. You can see it's kind of the lowest here on the plot, but it's still way better than all the other models. Right? So this is maybe more for the aficionados of how you do the train test split, but, and I could point you to this paper if or we could talk offline. Okay, so, um, okay, that is, I showed you kind of the result, right, which is you train a network and you get these neurons in it and it looks like the brain to some part. And now I think for the last a little less than a half hour, this is the fun discussion to have. It's like, what does this all mean? Where does that take us? What should we do next, right? So I don't want you to, you know, it's not about HMO. It's about a bigger picture here of, well, how is this giving us understanding of what's going on? in the visual system or any other system where you want to apply this result. I should say, this approach I see now being applied in you know, motor systems and other systems where people are basically optimizing neural networks to do a task and then comparing the internal units with the units that they measure. And that approach is having success in lots of domains within neuroscience. Here we showed it in vision because it was sort of well on that path for many decades and it's sort of well set up to succeed. Um, but now it's sort of being applied more broadly. But so that there's lots of good conceptual questions in there, whatever system you're working on. But let me, let me kind of show you how uh, the take home message from the HMO work that we really like people to remember is not so much about HMO, but about this broader message about performance optimization versus internal model matching. So this is how we got to HMO, in fact. So backing up to history, remember I said every time you have a, a, that model, it's like a family of models. If you pick the parameters of that CNN family, you can see some random network that may or may not be high performing. And um, each dot here is actually a sample with randomly sampled uh, parameters within the family of the, that, that we were messing with at the time. And what I'm plotting for you, oh, and the blacks are examples of existing models. I mentioned HMAX, PLOS09 was a model we built with that GPU optimization I referred to. These were other models that sort of existed as kind of control references for us. Here is performance on that invariant object recognition task that I mentioned we, um, that we thought was important to this part of the brain. This is, so this is a behavioral level measurement, just how good are you in an absolute sense? Not do you match the behavioral patterns, just how good are you? And this is a measure of functional fidelity to the primate brain of the last hidden layer. So this is essentially what I just showed you, that median explained variance once you do a mapping to IT. So th this, is, this is the measure I just showed you at 50%. Um, and what we thought we did I, maybe I'll back up a bit because, okay, let me, like, this is a good discussion. When you guys see this plot, what does it tell you? <laughs> if you were looking at this and saying, ah, what, what do you see on this plot? Are the dots correlated or not? Do you see correlation? Yes. Okay, there's a correlation between this and this. So if I say, I'm a neuroscientist and I care about this, then I see what I could do, right? Which is, I just showed you because I already clicked the slide. I could say, don't optimize for this, optimize for this, and this comes for free, right? So, and that was actually the trick because, hey, we don't have a lot of IT data to kind of fit parameters on, but we can get images all day long and run tasks and search computer vision databases to just do well on tasks, and then we'll for free get some neuroscience explanation power. And so what we did was we optimized a network, which I called like evolution in the computer. You can think of it as development if you like. Um, something like evolution development, probably not exactly biologies, but just give you a sense that we're searching some family of stuff to evolve a system. And we got to a system we called HMO that we first had in 2012, was first published in 2013, um, which was actually 50% you know, of the explainable variance. Um, that, that, um, that was kind of a strategy. So you have an AI goal. Computer vision, machine learning wants to do this, and neuroscience wants to do this, and look, our goals are now connected. 
um, right? So one goal, one drives the other, or maybe we do this and then that comes out, right? So this is sort of a big picture view you might want to have from this. Um, but it also leads to kind of, if you're a neuroscientist, it's like, well, maybe we should just stop building any models. We should just wait until this keeps going, and then we'll get an even better model, right? Someone else will do it for me. If they're, because this is not what our field of neuroscience classically is doing. We're supposed to be like asking if it looks like the brain or measuring the brain. And um, what do you guys think? So we just sit back. Does that sound right? What is it? So, this plot suggests it's right, right? But it also, you kind of have to keep in mind that we had kind of already put some neuroscience into the game. We sort of put the models in the right space to make this work. So if you think about that, it's like people get optimized and just optimizing off into wherever. There's no guarantee that that's going to keep helping us. <laughs> but it's because they're excited about working with networks now because this worked for them once. They're actually, in, again, a happy medium where we can kind of just watch what's happening in those fields and ask how brain-like is it becoming as these models continue to evolve. So that's what I'm going to show you next. But this is the big picture slide here. So right around this time, this is when AlexNet came out. Who has, who's heard of AlexNet? Only a few people. OK. So AlexNet was, um, um, was the, the reason AlexNet was, the, was kind of the breakthrough. It was the model that put the neural network models back on the map of computer vision. right? So for a long time, computer vision folks, and I would talk to them in conference, and they would be doing their probability thing and their you know, Bayesian version X, Y, or Z. And, you know, they were having a, they were, and then suddenly there were some groups, you know, I'd go in the meetings and, you know, Jan LeCun would be in the corner with his, you know, gradient descent network. And I'm like, Jan, this seems like it's, it's in the right direction because it looks like the brain, but there'd be no one at the poster. And he's like, yeah, but it doesn't work as well as the current thing. So, you know, computer vision would have these competitions of like, how good are you at doing things? And so ImageNet was one of their benchmark challenges, which was a categorization task of just saying, there's a thousand categories, there's a dog, is it a cat, they a thousand categories. Some of them are very weird and non-human derived, but you could go down, it's on the web, you can go look at it. But it's cool, it has a million images. So you have, and they had competition, so they could see what models were doing well. In 2010, here's a bunch of traditional computer vision models, and they're, this is their error rate, so lower is better here. And then in 2012, you suddenly see this dot where it kind of blew out all the other models. This was a big jump in performance moving down this far relative to all these models. Suddenly everybody took notice, uh-oh, there's a model that's doing so well. What are those guys doing? And what those guys were, well, this is Alex Krzyzewski and Jeff Hinton's lab. They were basically using GPUs and, and to train up deep neural networks that were sort of brain-like, that were roughly in the constraint space. They were doing the same thing we were trying to do with HMO, but for actual computer vision competition rather than to fit the brain. So they actually kind of won that competition in 2012. And then you see suddenly there was a couple blue dots left, but suddenly the whole field of computer vision decided this is the way to go. We're all going to build with neural networks. This is by far the way to go. And now they basically, this just keeps going down, right? So the old approaches have died out and been replaced by these CNN approaches of all kinds of stripes and colors and so forth. And I'll show you some of those in a minute. So that was around, that was the big breakthrough around 2012. There were articles in the New York Times more broadly about deep learning, not just deep networks for vision, you know, how inspired by theories about how the brain recognizes patterns. That's essentially the background that I've been giving you. So the way I like to think of this is, you know, some of us in brain and cognitive sciences, we're basically trying to follow this track of models, Fukushima, Grossberg, Ullman, I didn't mention these, HMAX, models that we were building. And we're just trying to build models of how the brain works. That was, that was our goal. And then computer vision had a bunch of threads going on. And it had this one thread that, again, was languishing for a while where you know, smart people were working on it, but it wasn't performing as well. And then suddenly around 2012, it started to perform well. And this is when these fields, I think, start really strongly converged. And what's cool about this is, is, again, this has continued to kind of pull. These threads have died out. Now computer vision is mostly pulling in these kind of neural network style threads. And now there's all these newer models, you know, you know VGG, ResNet, Exception, the list goes on and on. Um, and now that means that these are hypotheses for us to ask, how do these network models compare to the brain? Because they're building with neural-like hardware, I can make these comparisons with what we actually measure in the brain. So these are higher performing, and they were higher performing than the HMO model we had built. So if you remember my setup, I said, build a model that's like a neural network that performs well. And if you can do that, then look at its internals, and it looks like the brain. So these guys were doing that. And it's nice because they didn't care about neurons. They're just building something to try to be like the brain. So there's no overfitting of our data or anything you might be wondering about that our lab was building the model and comparing the neural data. So there's labs building models that are neural networks, and we can compare them with the brain. 
So I'm going to show you how do those models do when I ask their neurons and those models of how they look like the brain in IT. So remember, here's the AI goal. And now I'm changing this to ImageNet validation performance, because that's a computer vision benchmark. But this is essentially the same thing I had on that correlation plot before. Here's this neuroscience goal. This is, in this case, fitting IT. Here's some models that we later developed in our lab as a simplified class. It's not HMO anymore. Here's the HMO level. Ignore the numbers here, because these are not normalized data. I just want you to look at the absolute level. But here's HMO. Here's a bunch of other models in our class. And then here's AlexNet. So first thing, AlexNet was better than the HMO model at fitting our data, at predicting our resp IT responses. So when we published that way back here in these papers, if you're interested. Um, and so AlexNet kind of like, oh, that's cool. A computer vision model was actually also kind of fitting IT. So that kind of continues this correlation curve I've been describing. But um, yeah, so AI is kind of doing our work for us a bit. But you look more recently, this may be plateauing, maybe even going down. Um, so these more recent models, even though they're higher performing and winning these ImageNet competitions or doing better at them, they start gaining in performance. The correlation seems to be breaking now with these newer models, which is what you'd expect to happen at some point. At best, it's flat with respitting IT, but it may be it's kind of stuck right now with the style of models that people are building. Okay, does that, does that make sense? So the, you guys all with me? All right. I think this is kind of a... This is, I mean, this is sort of really relevant to the intersection of this course. Okay, way back to the beginning of yesterday, I said, hey, there's this behavioral data, and I kind of, it came up, I said, well, I'll give you that punchline earlier. These deep neural networks, you know, they met this barrier. So this isn't, doesn't look exactly the same. You see there's like a little more blue here than over here, but statistically, these are very hard to tell apart, and you can see that with your eyes. Suddenly, these, at these behavioral scores, these models started to look behaviorally a lot like humans and monkeys. And this is kind of your question about putting linear classifiers on them. This is sort of a version of that. So they're meeting this kind of behavioral benchmark. So these models are not quite explaining IT, but they're in the game behaviorally. So one of the things that we have been, that we've done uh, since then, and so now we're getting into more modern things. I'm giving you a bit of history of how we got to where we are is to like look more precisely at the behavior. And this came up yesterday, too. We're going to collect a lot more behavior out of humans on Mechanical Turk and monkeys in their home cages doing the thing I showed you yesterday. So we're on, this is, these are actually older numbers. We're sort of millions of trials now. And we can, then, um, we can then look now at much higher behavioral resolution. So we can now, these are like 24 object categories. Now I'm showing you individual images. There's 2,400 images here. And I can look at the probability Let's say if everybody was perfect, all the yellow here would be on this di these diagonal blocks. So you can look inside the diagonal block and see some images of a wrench are more blue here. This is just an example. So that means there, those are images where there's mistakes more often made on those images. And we can detect that reliably. This is a probability score. And similarly, sometimes images of a hammer are incorrectly called a wrench. Right, and that's, these are these yellow bars on this plot here. I'm just showing you this so you can get the intuition that we can now do image by image measurements of what's going on. You guys with me? Okay, so why we're doing this because we're like, these models, let's, I'm an experimentalist. Like, let's find out where they're broken, right? Because at this behavioral level, they don't look broken. Um, and so we can measure this on the ANNs. Here's humans and monkeys. We sort of discussed this yesterday. Now at the image grain, I, I, this is a different color scheme. Um, don't worry about the exact colors. All I want you to see is like, if you eyeball these, you can see the, all the little structure in here is actually very, very similar still between humans and monkeys, even at the image grain. We can't tell if it's perfectly the same yet, but it's really close. In fact, we can easily see even by eye, the current deep neural networks, you could take HMO, you could take any of those networks. They, you can see even by eye, there's something funny going on here. They're not Quite, they're getting some images right that the models, you know, the, the, the primates don't. Um, and they're getting a lot of images wrong that the primates do. And so there's something still kind of broken here when you look at the image level comparison. So again, the models aren't quite done yet. And we can quantify that for you. There's a gap here. There's, the models have gotten better. This is sort of time. There's AlexNet. Here's some of those newer models. But they're still not quite up to human primate level performance. So we have, here's a big picture summary of what I've been trying to tell you here today. 
you have these kind of summary deep neural networks that kind of have simulated ITs and V4s and so forth. You have the real brain. You have a kind of match at IT that's about 50%. V4s a little higher than 50%. Other groups, um, this is mostly uh, uh, Andreas Tolias, uh, Matthias Bethke's group, have been making comparisons in V1 and found actually quite good matches there as well with these lower levels of these networks, even optimized for recognition tasks. Um, and so, um, and then uh, behavior, I kind of showed you, it's like, I, this is about 80%. Um, it, it, that's, take that as an approximate number, but you can still see there's problems in there as I was in this paper here, if you'd like to see it. So this is kind of like we're in, we're, where we are at the moment. And so here's a sort of summary of what I maybe want to leave you with today. So one part of general visual recognition intelligence is we have core recognition as a set up task. Um, it's not the only thing of vision, but it's one important task. And what I try to tell you through all most of today is that several deep ANNs, I started with HMO, but I talked about AlexNet and some of the more recent ANNs, behave both internally, that is their neural units, and externally their behavior far more like the primate brain than previous artificial systems. And I, I showed you some of the quantification of that, both internal and I showed you some of the external things beginning yesterday and briefly here today. Um, this is really an intersection of what I think what this course is about. It's an intersection between ideas of brain science and ideas from AI. And I kind of, this is a kind of a version of the slide I showed you early on in the very early second slide I showed you yesterday. Um, I won't read this for you to say, but it's sort of the combination of these two things coming together is sort of what's enabled this. Um, and so if you take a summary of where our subfield is right now is that we've had achieved a good, let's call it approximately 50%, understanding of the initial ventral visual stream processing, just the first couple hundred milliseconds, not the learning, not the spatial layout of how the, the neurons live within the brain. I haven't talked about that at all. And, and one of its intelli core intelligent abilities, general core recognition. So um, this is kind of a half full, half empty story in my mind because this glass used to be down there and now we've sort of filled it up to there. So again, we, we should not lose sight of this has been a dramatic increase in progress in how we can, what we can explain in the brain. Um, but no deep NN passes all our tests. So even our current experimental data can rule out these models as we can falsify all existing models in that sense as being copies of what's actually going on in the brain, at least at this functional fidelity levels. And so here's where now I think this is a fun discussion to have in the last 10 minutes. It's like there's two views here, right? So and how we go forward. ANNs are fundamentally flawed as hypotheses of brain or visual function. And the other hypothesis is, um, no, the correct ANN is just is out there somewhere. We just need to find it. We just haven't found the right one yet. And I've kind of told you. So one way that we've gone about doing that. So um, I'm going to just, like, let's say, take hands. Who thinks, who thinks this? Who thinks they're flawed? OK, one flaw, a couple flaws, a few flaws. OK, who thinks they're, um, we just need to find it? Uh, maybe a bit more, OK. Um, everybody else is like doesn't care, I guess. Um, this is kind of a trick question, right? I kind of set this up yesterday too. It's like, I mean, to me, it's like this. You know, I didn't say. Um, I kind of said it in my phrasing, so maybe I led you guys on. I didn't say, you know, um, I, I I didn't say, you know, AlexNet is fundamentally flawed because that's true, right? It's like I'm basically saying. There is some way to simulate the brain in a neural network, I would presume, which is what I could call it anything that is an ANN, right? So, so it kind of, to me, it has to be like this. It's just what details do we have to put in and what ways do we have to set the parameters? But I realize that some people would say, well, Jim, I thought when you said ANN, you meant convolutional with certain type of learning. And if you put in those details, then of course, maybe you could say they're fundamentally flawed. But my view is there's some way, there's got to be some way, some neural network that's going to approximate what's going on inside the biological neural network. Because if that's not true, that's like the central dogma of neuroscience that we're computing with neural networks somehow to do all our fancy behavior. So that means there should be some artificial way of simulating that. Um, uh, to, to, to the levels of accuracy that at least we can measure experimentally. And so I think this is the way I would prefer that, to think about it, and I hope maybe you would too, is that we just need to find the right parameter sets uh, to do that. And how we do that is still an open question. So I'll like, leave you today with kind of one idea that um, we've been trying to do. It's not really an idea. It's more like a, trying to move us into the modern age as a field. Um, which is really what I've been trying to describe all along is I want one unified, I want to find 
one ANN that predicts many things, right? I just don't want one ANN that predicts IT and a different thing that predicts V4 and different things. That I want essentially a copy of what's going on across this whole system is what success looks like to me. So it should be 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100% all across the board, plus other things that maybe even aren't on the board yet. And that would be a kind of fully functional fidelic model of at least this part of the brain and its supported behavior. Um, and so, you know, I can quantify these right now as I did for you, like how good are current models at V4, IT, behavior, and if we sort of, these are the things that I've showed you today, and we can have a whole list, a set of things that we could measure. Um, and how can we use those, though, to find a better ANN, to guide mod discovery of either better, better ANNs? And the short answer is, I don't know. Uh, I, but I think my responsibility is to at least provide them as gradients on engineers searching the family. So I should at least be able to give you a score to know if you had a model, how good is it relative to other models by some integrated score of all these things. Um, and so we've taken that idea literally. And um, uh, Jonas Kubelius is a postdoc at Martin Shrimp in the lab, at, started something that we call BrainScore. We have a little archive paper. There's a website uh, which basically exposes all these metrics. If you have a neural network model and you want it to be scored, um, we're trying to automate all this. Right now, you can just send it to them or go to the site, and they'll score it for you. And there's like a leaderboard and so forth. And we're getting other data from other groups on here. We have you know, Andreas Tolias' data, Tony Moshin's data from V2, and we're trying to expand the kind of data metrics that we have here. So um, we're trying to take this idea literally to at least provide the community with a score of where it is. And I'll show you kind of now big picture again where the current neural networks look on this brain score. Again, this is all in this paper. Here's this same plot I showed you before, but now I'm not just showing IT, I'm showing a combination, an average of V4 IT and behavior as one big, um, we equally weighting them in this average. And you can see that, you know, there's AlexNet, it's kind of, it was up there. And then even though I said models had flattened out, if you look at them overall, they're continuing to increase. There was a nice run from 2012 or so to about today. Um, and, but now if you zoom in, it might be kind of like, again, plateauing, as I said earlier in the slide, in the talk. So it might need something other than performance drive to kind of keep this thing moving up on an overall brain score fit. And um, if you want to turn and look at the guts of it, you know, here's the behavior. The behavior, in, matching the behavior is mostly what's been driving this. IT and V4 have been kind of flattened. This is the part I showed you. This is kind of drifting down in IT. So the models are continuing to do better at predicting monkey and human behavior, but their internals, you know, we got to run out of this image performance trick that we used with the Yeman spork that I described, um, but it's not clear that, that that run has more juice in it. It needs more constraints from neuroscience to bring this up to these kind of levels that we think are probably possible in these models. So that was about where I wanted to end because I think this is, a, this is a good discussion point. We have five minutes, if, but if people have questions about the earlier part of the talk, I'm happy to also rewind. Or we could discuss this in its sort of forward-looking directions. Yes, so um, one there and then one there. Yes, so, go ahead. Uh, this one or the brain score? No, 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 but never Matching in quotes, because yeah. 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 you got to make an approximation. You're not going to get an, yeah. a perfectly biomimetic copy. Well, yeah. My, my question is, um, well, there, there is, I assume, a sort of an implicit assumption that the functional, that the, the brain is functionally modular. I mean, that does different things in kind of sort of independent ways, and that is physically modular. Do you, do you, do you think that was built into the models I showed? Did, would you call them modular, like the networks that I was drawing on the board, where they have these like areas with? Well, I would have said we're trying to simulate the whole ventral stream, and then we compare individual areas as sort of marker points along the way. Well, 
Yeah, so you're, yeah, that's a good question. So, so you're asking, well, maybe, you know, maybe, so when one version of this goes, I, somebody has a neural network model and there's some neurons in it and I'm like saying, hey, they don't look like IT neurons, so your model is wrong. And I'm like, I won't say the model's wrong, I'll just say it doesn't look like IT. But it could be like it looks like the, you know, LIP where I didn't record, right? And I, I sort of, I'm not trying to reject, I'm not trying to reject that model. I, my job is to find a model of the ventral stream. So I, I, I take your point, although I'm, I hope, if you guys think I'm talking about modular, I mean, I, I think my, in the neuroscience community, I'm like the opposite of modular, right? So if, if I'm presenting you guys a modular talk, I could give you some other people that would give you a real modular talk. So these the networks are just connected sets of things to me, and the modules are some just handles of like, well, there's a place called IT that we can reliably go to every monkey and say, I'm going to record over there. But that's just a sort of a reference point. It's not meant to say it's modular function in some some strong way. But I think you're making the point about ventral stream module as opposed to all of vision. In that sense, I'm a ventral stream modular guy in the whole setup. Is that, is that your, is that your kind of like? Oh, yeah, I, I, I don't, right? So that's a good, so right. So kind of what you're asking, I think, is like, well, maybe this other part of IT that's not explained is because if you keep optimizing for core recognition tasks, you're never going to get all of IT because IT supports more than core recognition. Is that, that's, and I totally agree with that point. So right, these are the, so now you see, if we map this back to those three things from machine learning, architecture, task, optimizer. In my mind, you're pushing on task, right? We said categorization. You're like, well, why don't you do categorization plus something else or maybe just something else? So you're, those are the terms of the hypothesis space that now we're now engaged in in this discussion, which I think are the useful terms, like change the task and see if you can align the system to be better, like the brain still using, and then it would show up on our brain score as like, oh, suddenly it looks better. Now maybe you need a mixture task, but so if you were able to execute on that, it, it, we're trying to be ready to show you you're actually on the right track by these kind of measures. That's sort of what I view my job as. So I'm encouraging you in that direction, and you know, Dan Yamans and others are moving in those kind of directions. Um, and that is a great direction. I mean, it, it's not, again, that's, that's where this field, this is exciting because you're talking in machine learning terms now, but actually intersecting with the neuroscience to me because you're, you're talking about task um, and that's sort of top down. And that, that is not the way neuroscientists typically would approach this problem. I think it's the way they need to be approaching this problem and that, that's what I'm, I'm the pre preacher of, to that field of what this is how it should be. And, Trust me, I, I, maybe you guys are receptive to this, but there's a lot of pushback in our field as to whether this even counts as a way you're supposed to do science and neuroscience. So and maybe we, we could talk about that. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so right. So I think one translation of your question, which is a good one, is you're asking like, what's the form of generalizable knowledge we hope to take from these approaches? And frankly speaking, I'm not. I frankly, I'm not looking for generalizable knowledge. I'm looking for a copy that I can do things to the ventral stream with, like brain machine interfaces or some of the things I'll show you tomorrow, right? So this is kind of, this is where I am more of a biologist than a machine learning person. I'm not really a machine learner by training. Um, I'm an engineer and, you know, biology is full of hardware specific examples that we need to sort out if we want to fix it. Or, you know, it may be like, maybe it's an old processor, but we better know how that 8086 works if we want to fix it, right? So, so it's kind of like a, that, I'm not necessarily looking for generalizable knowledge out of this to say, memory. If there's something generalizable, it's the performance driven approach, right? So you could again step back and say, let's change the architecture to make it more like the memory systems of the brain, performance optimize again, check the neurons using all the mapping stuff that those guys have already worked out, and replay it under a new problem. But for me in my lab, it's more about how do I get a kind of something that is most like a ventral stream, even if it doesn't generalize. Maybe it'll generalize some ideas to the other sensory systems. But I don't, memory, that may be a stretch. And I, I'm not even as presuming that we would even get such a thing out of this approach, right? I hope I didn't, con I didn't try to convey that idea other than the performance-driven idea. So, so I, 
guess I'm saying I admit that this isn't going there, but I still think it's important if you want to understand how vision works, you need to get an engineered version of what's going on in the visual system, even if it only applies to the visual system. Does that, does that, I just want to make sure you understand where I am. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. I'm just kind of giving you my perspective. Exactly, and that's kind of when you look at the brain and you ask questions about memory, you look, there's a different, arch the hippocampal architecture doesn't look like the architectures I've been using here, for instance, right? And I didn't put basal ganglia and other, you know, that, those are forward-looking questions to other brain systems and other problems. Vision is in a more mature state, so I can kind of do this here, but how to translate it will require restarting the architectures to those other systems, exactly as you say. Yeah, so we're, we're kind of over time, but maybe, Davide, you have one more, and then... Maybe, uh, one, provo one provocative question. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> no, in, in the sense that the, I remember the discussion that you and I did at the time in the original life, but then there was this other whole uh, feeling that it was extremely hard not to make sense of the tuning of the uh, And now, you are right to a point in which you are making sense of the tuning. In the sense, you do have a model that is uh, many... Right. It can it can explain and predict the variance. Yeah. But then the question is, okay, this kind of model is not like a model of the same Right. Go to your grandmother and say, look, no one people does. It's a bunch of detectors, so everyone gets a filter. I mean, I can explain it to my son or my son, right? Now here. Right, so, so I, this is a great question. This is the discussion I want to have, and we'll start it, we'll have it tomorrow, but because I think, but, but just the brief version is like, what can you do, what is understanding for? And one thing it's for is for communicating with other human beings, and I'm not trying to, that is what, that was your V1 example, tell my grandmother, and that is not, that is only one thing that it's for, and this is not giving you that other than to say performance optimized, and that's not a satisfying thing to most grandmothers, I would say. Right, so, um, but it is actually the most compressed version of the understanding. It gives you performance optimized within the architectural space and you will get a copy of what's going on. Tell your grandmother that and she should be happy. Vision scientists aren't happy with that. But the other things models are for, are for sort of acting as foundations for other experiments and this certainly gives you that. It also gives you things like, you know, predictions for neural control, which I'll show you tomorrow. It gives you sort of setups for BMI. It gives you the things that engineers actually need and it's reproducible in downloadable code and falsifiable as models should be. So it sort of strives in all those ways to be like science. But it's hard, it's not communicatable to your grandmother in a way. And that is actually the tension that I mentioned at the beginning that people are not happy because they thought that's what they're supposed to do. And I think there's lessons in you know, physics or other fields where actually you get to the edge of a science, you make it a real science that this always happens to some degree. And we're moving from a heuristic science where we communicate in words to one where we're going to communicate in models and downloadable code and there'll be, there'll be some bumpiness there in terms of what people kind of want and that's what we're going through right now. Um, but in the long run, you know, I can tell you all, the co same colleagues that sort of say this is an understanding, then they show up, you know, six months or a year later saying, look, I've discovered that V4 neurons are fit by a deep neural network, they just cast in a different language. So even if they don't like it, they're all using it, right? So the field is, and if you talk to older scientists, they complain, younger scientists, they're all on board. So it's just a matter of like, you know, was it Feynman who said science proceeds one professor's death at a time. So the field will naturally kind of move this way. I already see it happening. But I, I will return to this question tomorrow because I think it is a good discussion about science in general and what models do for them. But let me let you guys go and thank you and we'll talk tomorrow. Thanks.